Good morning. My name is Randy Boggess, and welcome to Unity of, of Aliso Viejo. We welcome you this morning in the name of all that is beautiful and sacred. You're welcome here at Unity regardless of creed, color, ethnicity, race, socioeconomic background, sexual orientation, or disability. At Unity, we leave no one out. Well, we like to start out with a little humor, so this is no different than any other Sunday, thanks to my research assistants. I was always taught to respect my elders, but it keeps getting harder and harder to find one. <laughs> the irony of life is that by the time you're old enough to know your way around, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> The definition of frustration, trying to find your glasses without your glasses. <laughs> and finally, this is a message on an answering machine. I am not available right now, but thank you for caring enough to call. I am making some changes in my life. Please leave a message after the beep. If I do not return your call, you are one of those changes. <laughs> Well, we have been having a wonderful series on building a house of happiness within us so that we have happiness from the inside out. And if you've missed any of these, this is our last in the seven-part series. You can go on YouTube or on our website and watch any of them to catch up. But we started with the foundation, and after we laid the foundation, we started with the pillar of the mind, the pillar of the body and the pillar of the emotions, and then we put the roof on top, and then last week we had the garden. And today we're putting in that last pillar. It's the pillar of love. And it is the most important thing in building any house. To make it a home, it has to have love. And so the pillar of the heart, let love lead, is our focus this morning. A wonderful writer, Robert Tizon, wrote, I would rather have lips that cannot speak, eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, than a heart that cannot love. Love truly is the most important value, emotion, essence in our lives and in our world. Throughout history, spiritual traditions have spoken about love as the lotus or the diamond, the most precious element in the soul. From the Upanishads, we read, in the center of our own body, there is a small shrine in the form of a lotus flower and within it can be found a small space with a precious gem. The heavens and the earth are there. The sun, the moon, and the stars, fire and lightning and winds. The whole universe dwells within the heart. And heart energy isn't just confined to that space. You feel heart energy when you're around someone who's loving. You feel it because it, it's, it's like an aura, this energy field that goes out. And we feel that when we're by someone who's loving. Think of a happy time in your life. Maybe it was when you got your first pet. And don't you read, you can just not only remember, but maybe even feel that feeling that you had at that time. And it wasn't confined to your heart. It was everywhere. I remember my maternal grandfather grew boysenberries in his backyard in San Diego. And he loved his garden. And we would go down uh, from the high desert, and we'd pick boysenberries. And the love he had for his garden went. You know, I mean, you could feel it. It was an energy field. And every one of us has that. We have an energy field. And if it's loving, people rush in to meet us. And if it's not, they kind of step back. Now, in the HeartMath Institute, they have um, 
a measure of emotions. And this, um, they, t they took an EKG and measured people's EKG when they were frustrated and anxious and when they were showing love or appreciation. So frustration looks like that. Appreciation is smooth. And when we're frustrated, don't we feel like that? And that really does damage to the heart. It, it is a factor in whether or not we get heart disease or not. And so love is not only good for the mind and the heart and the soul, but also for the body. All of our emotions are either about love or about fear. So now let's go to our first point, which is on your outline, focus on gratitude. And I've included the quotes this morning because I think they're so good. The first is by Meister Eckhart, who was a 13th century theologian. He writes, if the only prayer you said in your whole life was thank you, that would suffice. How much time during the day do you spend saying, thank you, God? Most of us, first thing in the morning, thank you, God. Just the, for, as Bruce said, waking up and not finding your name in the obituary. <laughs> thank you, God, for, for the gift of friendship and the gift of a beautiful day and the gift of work that you love to do. Um, thank you, God, for a beautiful spiritual community. Gratitude, when we focus on gratitude, our heart energy increases and our love increases. Imagine sitting in a dark room that was lit by just one candle that is almost burned down. As you watch, the candle flame flickers, sputters, seems to fade, and then leaps up again. A drop of fragile light in the inky blackness around you. You see that it is only a matter of minutes before it is completely gone. A number of years ago, Rico's life was like that flame. A little longer or the smallest puff of breath, and the flame would have been out. It was that close. As a young man, he felt out of sync with the um, people around him. He attended an Ivy League college to please his parents, but didn't fit in. And in his junior year, he traveled to France and uh, went to a Trappist monastery for a year. But he realized after being there for a year, although it was a very loving and uh, growing place, that that really was not his calling. So he came back and finished school. He married, he had children, and became a chiropractor and had a practice um, on the coast of Maine. And then he started not feeling well. And he and his wife had some disagreements, and they came to an agreement together that their marriage really wasn't working. And for both of them, it was time to separate and divorce. So he went through that and still felt worse and worse and worse. He went to doctor after doctor after doctor, and they said he was a hypochondriac. They could find nothing wrong with him. So he was at the depth of despair when he decided he would take his own life. But he didn't want to hurt his family. So he was going, his plan was to take a train into town, into the city, and just walk in front of a bus. It would just be one of those strange accidents that happens. And then it was the day before Father's Day, and there in his stack of mail was an envelope from his ex-wife, the mother of his children. He opened the envelope to find a card with beautiful artwork on the front that she had done herself. Inside the card, she had written a message that turned his world upside down. She told him that she still felt deep love and appreciation for him. She was sincerely happy that he was the father of her children. She said that despite the challenges they had been through, 
she had grown profoundly in his company and that she wished him nothing but wonderful health, good fortune, and happiness. Well, within 24 hours, he was introduced to a specialist who was able to define what was wrong with him. He had been infected with seven types of parasites from all his travels around the world between the time he left college and the time he got married. He'd traveled for seven years and picked up all those parasites. So they put him on a parasitic medication. It was all cleared up in a week, and he felt wonderful. He, it was a miracle. And he went to a Zen master who gave him a wonderful mantra, and I've started using it. Thank you for everything. I have no complaints whatsoever. Thank you for everything. I have no complaints whatsoever. And isn't that really the truth? We have nothing to complain about. We live in the most abundant country in the world. Yes, there are problems all around us. And some of us are going through difficult times. But we are so blessed, and there's so much to be grateful for. Brother David Steindelrast is a very youthful Benedictine monk. As a teenager in Austria during the Nazi occupation, he'd never expected to reach the age of 20. In this picture, he's 80 years old. Food was scarce. His family often lived on little more than soup made with weeds. And he was sure he'd be drafted and probably killed in combat. But he'd been happy despite all the dangers and difficulties because against the backdrop, of impending death, he had seen the, that life was a gift. That deep sense of appreciation has never left him. Brother David offers a unique perspective on gratitude. He said that gratefulness is not just about being grateful for the laundry list of things we have in our lives. No matter how much or how little you have in life, you can still be grateful. To Brother David, gratefulness means experiencing great fullness. Don't you love that? Gratefulness is great fullness. Nothing is lacking. You are full of the divine. You are full of the Christ. And how can we not be grateful? Mark Beckoff wakes up happy every morning, and he goes to the window, and he says, good morning, sky, good morning, sun, good morning, grass, good morning, flowers. And he once had a house guest, and he said, are you out of your mind? And he said, no, I'm just so grateful for everything. And then his mother became very ill. She had a series of four strokes. She lived in Florida. He lived in Massachusetts. And so he went down to be with her. She was paralyzed from the neck down. And he didn't know how much she really understood. But he surrounded her with joy. And he would, to get away from the tension, he would go on long walks. And one day he stopped and bought some flowers for her. And uh, as he was walking up towards the house with this beautiful smile and this beautiful bouquet, the nosy neighbor comes out. And what does she say? How dare you be happy when your mother is in the next room dying? Mark answered, because it is such a beautiful day, and I know if she were more aware, my mother would love this day. He went to his mother's bedside and put the flowers on her lap. She looked at them, and though she couldn't respond, Mark likes to think that she enjoyed their beautiful scent. Even when his mother was dying, Mark could still be grateful for the gift of her presence. Focus on gratitude. The second step in letting love lead is to practice forgiveness. And Robert Mueller, the former Assistant General, Secretary General to the United Nations, writes, to forgive is the highest most beautiful form of love. 
In return, you will receive untold peace and happiness. Mary Lodge was sound asleep when she received that phone call at 3.30 in the morning that every mother dreads. It was her oldest son calling to tell her that her younger son, her youngest son, Robbie, and his friend, Sean, got in an argument, and Sean had a gun, pulled it out, and shot Robbie, and Robbie was dead. She was filled with rage and grief at the thought of losing her youngest son. Sean was deeply sorrowful and remorseful. He pled guilty so there wouldn't be a trial. He didn't want to put Robbie's family through that. And so Mary was there on the day that he received his sentence, and she asked to address the court, and the judge said no. So she asked if she could meet with uh, Sean after the proceedings in his office, in his chambers, and he agreed to that. And so she writes, I was frisked and led into a small paneled office. Sean stood trembling in the corner with his hands and feet shackled, wearing a baggy orange prison jumpsuit. His head was down, and although he was 20 years old, he was crying like a baby, sobbing his heart out. As I watched this boy so forlorn, no parents, no friends, no support, all I saw was another mother's son. I asked the bailiff if I could approach Sean. At this, Sean looked up, revealing a childlike face stained with tears. Suddenly, I found myself asking, may I give you a hug? He nodded his consent. The bailiff motioned me toward the prisoner, and I walked over to Sean, and I put my arms around him. He just melted into my shoulder. It was the first compassion he had from anybody for a long, long time. As I stood there holding him, I felt my anger and hatred melt away. Still, what came out of my mouth next surprised everyone, including me. Sean, I forgive you for this horrible thing you have done. Our eyes connected for a few moments. I would rather my Robbie be where he is than be going to prison. I will pray for you every day. I asked Sean to keep in touch with me, and then the bailiff escorted me from the room. And Mary continues to write to Sean during his incarceration. Forgiveness is not a gift we give to someone else. It's a gift we give to ourselves. We're not condoning the behavior, but we're seeing the person as someone who was confused, made a mistake, was angry, but is a child of God, worthy of our love and our forgiveness. When you understand the suffering of others, that transforms our resentment into compassion. And so the first step is to focus on gratitude, secondly, practice forgiveness, and third, spread loving kindness. And the quote is from a 19th century Scottish novelist, J.M. Barrie. Those who bring sunshine into the lives of others cannot keep it from themselves. And the last story is um, about CJ. She was 41 and had been suffering from lupus and scleroderma for 12 years. She was confined to a motorized wheelchair and felt very, very sorry for herself. And she had been reading um, the works of the Dalai Lama and was very comforted by them. And a friend told her about a local lama, and so she went to see him. And um, what he had to say 
surprised her. He said, stop feeling sorry for yourself and help others. She was shocked. That was not the Dalai Lama's message that she'd been reading. But she took it to heart. And the next time she was in the grocery store in her motorized wheelchair, she noticed a woman behind her who was obviously having a really bad day. She had a cart that was full of groceries. And she was just very irritated and impatient. And CJ turned around and she said, please, it looks like you're in a hurry. Please go ahead of me. And of course, this woman looks at her in her wheelchair and she said, I couldn't do that. CJ said, please, it would make me happy. So she went ahead of her and immediately her physical being changed. She was cheerful with the cashier, which before she probably would have bit her head off. And she was kind to the bag boy. And everybody around her seemed to pick this up. And they turned to CJ and said, how wonderful of you to do that. And that was the beginning for CJ to get the attention off herself and on to someone who had more challenges than she did. It wasn't long before she was out of the wheelchair, being extremely radiant and mobile. In fact, after Hurricane Katrina, she went to Louisiana and helped in the rescue effort. That's what loving kindness does. It changes us. It heals us. And it's not just in Christianity that we find this agape love. But in Buddhism, it's called metta. In Judaism, it's called rakahim. And in Islam, mahaba. It is universal, just like that lotus and the diamond. Within every one of us, the pillar of the heart encourages us to let love lead, to focus on gratitude, to practice forgiveness, and to spread loving kindness wherever we go. Let's take a moment to do this inwardly. We thank you, sweet spirit for all the gifts of life. We are so grateful for everyone around us, the work that we do, the love that we share. We are grateful for the power of forgiveness and loving kindness. Amen. And this part of our service is called our Sacred Walk of Abundance. And if you have not picked up your affirmation card from the bookstore, please do so today and read it at least once a day. It says, Unity of Aliso Viejo is rich in blessings given and received. We are prosperous indeed. Thank you, God. And there's still plenty out there, and we thank Reverend Leslie for um, making sure that we have these. And now, um, before we bless our offerings, I invite you, after they're blessed, to come forward and take a blessing from the blessing bowl, because prosperity is not just about giving, it's also about receiving. And if you've brought a financial gift, to place it in the plate. If you give automatically through your bank or your credit card, in the slot in front of you, there's probably a little green plastic-covered card. Please take that out and use it as a substitute for your gift and bless it and bring it up and place it in the, in the plate. So let's take our gifts now, hold them in our hands, and bless them with the words of our offering blessing. Together, divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I give and all that I receive. Amen. Our musicians will now lead us into a time of meditation.
rest in your eternal arms. Quietly I go within and hear. Be still and know that I am God. invite you to relax ever so gently now and focus your attention in the area of your heart. If you like, you may put your hand over your heart to help. If your mind wanders out of habit, just keep shifting your attention back to the area of the heart. As you focus on the area of your heart, imagine your breath is flowing in and out through your heart. This helps your mind and energy to stay focused and your respiration and heart rhythms to synchronize. Breathe slowly and gently until your breathing feels smooth and balanced. Continue to breathe with ease until you find a natural inner rhythm that feels perfect for you. As you continue to breathe, recall a positive feeling, a time when you felt really good inside. And now re-experience that feeling. It may be a feeling of appreciation or care toward another person, a pet, a place you enjoy, or an activity that was wonderful. Allow yourself to feel this good feeling of appreciation or care. And once you've found a positive feeling, sustain it by continuing your heart focus, heart breathing, heart feeling in the quiet, in the stillness, in the sacred silence.
as we gently return our attention back to this time and place, let us sing softly together, Sweep Over My Soul. 